the Palestine Exploration Fund was funded in 1865, the West's knowledge of the Levant, the area which we deal with, was very, very um, patchy. And uh, the West's interest in the region as well was also equally patchy. And it's surprising maybe to look at it from our perspective now, but there wasn't a really um, considered um, and consistent uh, interest in this part of the world prior to around the middle of the 19th century. Travellers had been individuals. The uh, tradition of pilgrimage didn't really exist in a Protestant sense. Uh, that's very much more associated with the Catholic countries. And so when the PEF was set up in 1865, it really was uh, a one-of-a-kind organisation. We were established by Dean Arthur Stanley of Westminster and George Grove, who later became the founder of the Royal Academy of Music, to look into the physical reality of what they termed the Holy Land. They realised that the knowledge of the uh, both scholars and the general populace of the West of this part of the world was incredibly patchy and they needed to do something about it. But rather than look into matters concerning biblical texts or um, ideas of beliefs and assessing religious beliefs of one kind or another, they decided to focus on the physical side of the area, looking at the geography, the natural history, the archaeology, the ancient history and the geology and so on. And these are the subjects which concerned them from the outset. Before we were founded, an expedition to Jerusalem was sent out just before, in the winter of 1864, and this was uh, conducted by the Ordnance Survey of Jerusalem. The person who instigated this was actually George Grove. He was interested in the Holy Land very much. He was a very good Hebrew scholar, as well as being as well as being an engineer and as well as being a a, a musician. Um, so he was uh, a very uh, busy man, but he was very interested in understanding more about the Holy Land. Um, there was a push to supply water for the Holy City at this time, something that a lot of people in Victorian society were jolly keen about, having just discovered that cholera was a waterborne disease. And uh, George Grove managed to persuade the uh, funders to put money into a preliminary survey of Jerusalem. And these included people like Baroness Burdett Coots. And they funded a survey which would lay the path for uh, an engineered water supply, which actually didn't happen for rather a long time. But the result of that survey, which was conducted by Charles Wilson of the Royal Engineers for the Ordnance Survey, was that suddenly people's interest in the Holy Land and what it might um, reveal and what interesting things there might be there was awakened. The volume of photographs taken by Sergeant uh, James MacDonald of the Royal Engineers really, I think, sparked people's imagination. And I think it's really on the back of that that the PEF was able to be founded on public subscription the following summer in 1865. Again, Charles Wilson, who was so important for that Royal Ordnance Survey, became incredibly important for the PEF and was a central figure in its history right up until his death in the early 20th century. Um, the first thing that the PEF did was to send Charles Wilson on a reconnaissance survey. He covered the area around the Sea of Galilee and the North Jordan Valley and a little bit of Samaria. And what he was doing basically was finding out how much a large survey of the whole country would cost, what the kind of logistical problems there were, what kind of equipment they would need, etc, etc. And he came back um, having collected a lot of very, very important material and the PEF then understood the kind of um, project that they had set themselves. They wanted to survey the whole country, they wanted to produce the first accurate map and to provide alongside that map a whole raft of reliable data. One of the interesting things about the PEF is the manner, the kind of organisation that it set out to be right from the outset. The PEF, a lot of people imagine, was set up as a missionary organisation or it was some kind of government agency 
um, which was there to uh, spy on Her Majesty's behalf. In fact, we were neither. We've always been established as a non-political, non-religious, and scientific organization. And in the uh, opening um, notes of our, our, our society, it's very clear from the Bishop of York's speech that, yes, on the one hand, lots of people were interested in this part of the world because of biblical connections, but so many people from with so many different interests were coming together to form this society that no single ideology or interest group should dominate uh, at the expense of anybody else and so very very strong scientific principles were going to keep everybody on the straight and narrow and interestingly even though our founders came from uh, very established um, Victorian society, Dean Arthur Stanley of Westminster was, is sometimes uh, referred to as Queen Victoria's chaplain, um, a very influential man indeed. He was also very much at the forefront of thought of the day. He was not a stick in the mud. He was a friend of Thomas Huxley, who was who's also referred to as Darwin's bulldog. So he was one of these people who was very interested, not in turning aside science, but involving science in his life and in the life of, of, of the country. And not saying that that meant that he had to throw his religious beliefs aside, but that those two could coexist side by side. And that's the kind of organization that the PEF was right from the very outset, very open-minded, very broad church, again, actually Dean Arthur Stanley's invention, and bringing in information, expertise from all sorts of different areas to furnish our understanding of the Levant better. Following Wilson's survey in the, uh, in 1865, 1866, uh, the PEF then decided it needed to focus on a specific project. One of the main reasons for this was to get money. It needed a project which people would fund by becoming members, by becoming subscribers. And it realized that from the experience of all the Ordnance Survey of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem was a draw. It was something that was going to bring people into the PEF and furnish them, hopefully, with more money. And so for the um, project of going and excavating at Jerusalem, they hired the services of uh, another royal engineer, Charles Warren, a young lieutenant straight out of Chatham, and he was hired to explore Jerusalem. Now at the time there was quite a bit of debate going on in scholarly circles about the nature of ancient Jerusalem, about where the temple of the Jews would have been, about where the church of the Holy Sepulchre would have been, and about where the lines of the ancient city walls at the time of Jesus' death would have been as well. There was a friend of George Groves called James Ferguson who was a very important and influential architectural historian who had devised a theory based on the plans produced by other people, he had never visited Jerusalem himself, that the Temple of Jerusalem was not on the site of the Dome of the Rock, as traditionally believed, but was actually on the site of what is now the Al-Aqsa Mosque at the south end of the Temple Mount. He believed also that the Dome of the Rock was in fact a Byzantine building and the remains of the rotunda of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which would mean therefore that the temple could not be on that same spot. They would be two contemporary buildings existing on the same spot at the same time and an impossibility, hence the move he suggests to the Al-Aqsa Mosque location. Um, con all he, he, he believed also that the current, the traditional location of the Church of the, the Holy Sepulchre was wrong and that the building was an entire a later fabrication and had no Byzantine core. Um, so Warren was sent out really to investigate the plausibility of Ferguson's theories. Were they viable? Would they work on, in, in reality? Or was he actually incorrect? Um, and when Warren went out, he devised a strategy of exploring the topography of Jerusalem in a way that had never been done before, not by the Ordnance Survey a few years previously by Charles Wilson. This was a, an excavation in a way of digging shafts down to track the underlying bedrock beneath the millennia of detritus that had built up in Jerusalem's various valleys. 
And so the physical picture of ancient Jerusalem would have been very different from the slightly, well, considerably more level picture that the 19th century traveller would have seen to something much more hilly and valley, much more undulation in the landscape. And Charles Warren went about digging shafts right down into the, uh, down to bedrock, around the Temple Mount area, thereby revealing the considerable topographical variations that would um, have existed in the ancient city. What he proved by doing this was that it was impossible for a Semitic temple of any description, whether that be Nabataean or Phoenician or Hebrew, to have existed at the southern end of what is now the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount, because that structure exists on a huge platform that is built up um, to create a level with the top of that ancient hill. At the time of um, King Herod and any previous um, Jewish structure, that would have been at the bottom of the valley. And the problem with that is that that's not where you find Semitic temples. You find Semitic temples at high places. High places are the central feature, as it were, of anything vaguely Semitic, connect, whether it's Canaanite, Phoenician, or Assyrian, think of the ziggurat, or indeed um, Hebrew and later Jewish. So um, Ferguson's theory for the temple being located at the southern end was shown to be incorrect. Warren also showed that the Dome of the Rock was indeed an Islamic building and he also managed to trace elements of the Herodian city wall as well to suggest that the location of the, Do of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which would have to be outside the city walls, a place of uh, execution and burial, um, was reasonable given the location it had been traditionally put in in the church that we know today. So Warren did a huge amount of work. He also uncovered a vast amount of material from the Herodian structure and from later um, periods of uh, uh, Jerusalem's history. Also some, some uh, material from the very early, early Bronze Age, that's 3rd millennium BC settlement, and even Middle Bronze Age as well. So he really laid the groundwork uh, for the future study of Jerusalem uh, in a way that nobody really has been able to emulate since because of the political difficulties that exist surrounding excavation and study of, of any monuments in Jerusalem. So his work is really significant and is still the, 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 really the foundation of, of Jerusalem archaeology. However, Ferguson didn't give in and he gave Warren a very, very hard time and Warren really had to fight his corner for his evidence to be accepted as real, as fact, and for Ferguson's theories to be overturned. What this project did was it gained huge uh, attention for the PEF, and on the back of that and the interest shown by the public, the PEF was able to launch its real fundamental work, which was the Survey of Western Palestine. The Survey of Western Palestine was the real jewel in the crown, I suppose, of, of PEF projects. Uh, it took place 1871 to 1878, and again we hired the services of the Royal Engineers to carry out a really first-rate um, three-dimensional trigonome trigonometrical survey for the PEF. And the area we were conducting uh, this survey in was what we called Western Palestine, that is basically everything up to the River Jordan, so what we would turn now Israel, Palestine, a little bit of Lebanon down into, uh, yeah, basically that's it. Um, Eastern Palestine was what we would now call Jordan, um, so that that's the geographical terminology that was in place at the time. And the people we uh, hired, as I say, were royal engineers. We had this great connection through George Grove, who was a, himself a, an engineer, with the royal engineers, which enabled us to make the use of, by far and away, the best professional surveyors and mappers anywhere in the world. They were the, they were the cream of the crop. 
and what we provided in return was rather useful field training for young new uh, graduates uh, straight out of uh, the college um, in a non-confrontational, non-combat situation. So they were able to hone their field uh, skills um, in a part of the world which was relatively benign, relatively. Having said that, they did experience all sorts of troubles, all of these people, Wilson, Warren, and the people conducting the survey of Western Palestine. They suffered any number of different diseases, malaria, typhoid, yellow fever, cholera, all sorts of nasties. They suffered also a great deal of trouble trying to negotiate a way between uh, uh, various Ottoman officials, various different local interest groups, I suppose you could say, and sometimes uh, things got uh, a little bit hairy. The weather was also very, very difficult. You had quite big extremes of weather in this part of the world. It can in winter, especially up in the hills, be extremely cold. Uh, places like Bethlehem regularly get snow in the winter. And in the summer months, in, especially in places like the Jordan Valley, it is terribly, terribly hot. And so your um, average English uh, Royal Engineer might find these things quite hard to um, accommodate. Also there was difficulty with in infrastructure, roads were not always very good, uh, communications and so on. The first person to head the Survey of Western Palestine was a Captain Stewart, but he lasted a few weeks before indeed he succumbed to illness and had to be shipped back home. His replacement and the person who really is associated most with this huge body of work was Lieutenant Claude Rainier Conder. And he is a wonderful personality and a great figure, a great part of PEF history. And it was under his command that uh, the survey was conducted. His number two was Charles F. Tewitt Drake, who was a very experienced explorer and traveller, a companion of none other than Richard Burton in his time, and who was very, very familiar with the people and the language of the area. In uh, 1872, or three, Charles Tewitt Drake fell ill and eventually he died. His replacement was someone who Quanda recommended as having met while he was at Chatham, who was a young Lieutenant H. H. Kitchener. And indeed this was the uh, future Lord Kitchener of Khartoum's first field placement, was on the survey of Western Palestine, and he came out and joined the party in 1874. And we have a wonderful letter in our archives from Conda to Walter Besant, which says, uh, I can't wait for Kitchener to arrive, looking forward to it. Have you met him? Nice chap, not a great beauty. <laughs> so um, there's uh, a great deal of interest, obviously, in Kitchener as a person. Go. During the 1880s, the PEF concentrated on adding to the work that had been done on the survey of Western Palestine. It conducted surveys in Eastern Palestine, what we would call Jordan, and also the Wadi Araba. And it also utilised the work of other people to supplement the work that we were able to do ourselves. So for example, the surveys of Gottlieb Schumacher, a German surveyor working on the Haifa to Damascus Railway, um, were used for northern Transjordan, Eastern Palestine, the area around Umqais, Abila and Pella. And these helped to complete the map of uh, Palestine as we would have described it um, to a manner which was uh, very acceptable indeed. In the 1890s we decided to take a slightly different course with a large body of the survey work having been completed. We felt that the time was right to conduct, again, a more specific project, maybe in a similar vein to Warren's Jerusalem project a few years earlier. And we were able to acquire the services of William Flinders Petrie, who at that moment was not excavating in Egypt for various reasons. He'd been having a little bit of an argument with the local uh, authorities there. And he was looking also to answer a few questions concerning some pottery which had, he had found in the royal tombs at Saqqara and Abydos. To him they didn't look particularly Egyptian. 
he was wondering if they could be imported from elsewhere in the region and two of the candidates were Palestine or um, Cyprus. Petrie was interested in discovering the origin of these uh, foreign pots which he called abideosware because of the place where he had originally found them and they were high status vessels very nicely made dating well now we know they date to the third millennium from the early bronze age um, all handmade uh, very elegant jugs juglets containing things like olive oil wine possibly perfumed oils as well maybe things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, acquire in Egypt easily they had to be imported goods and high status goods at that and so when the PEF asked him would he be interested in running an excavation in Palestine he was very keen and he took us up on uh, our invitation at the top you've got the early Bronze Age material um, so 3rd millennium BC and then we move on to Middle Bronze Age 2nd millennium BC and into the late Bronze Age, time of the Egyptian Empire in the region, which is really from 1550 BC to about 1200, 1150 BC, thereabouts. Um, and in this period, you see a gradual change from locally made things, not then much in the way of imports, to increasing imports from elsewhere and influence from elsewhere through to a really, really dynamic international market with stuff coming in from Cyprus, from Mycenae, Egypt as well, local imitations of all their kind of things as well. And of course, this uh, material from this part of the world, from Canaan, would be going out to other parts of the Aegean and into Egypt and so on, back and forth. And then you have down here we have Iron Age material from Iron II period where we see a much more local um, situation. You haven't got the big empire of the late Bronze Age, you've got local, um, uh, in terms of the, the political organisation, this is of course, <laughs> this is a big question. Nobody really actually understands what happened until quite late in the day. But what you do have is the uh, emergence of the alphabet in use. Um, as opposed to cuneiform and hieroglyphics, which we used previously. We do think that the origins of the alphabet predate the Iron Age quite significantly, but this is the first chance that it's had really to shine um, when the Egyptians basically leave this area to its own devices for a little bit. Down at the bottom we have a little bit of Persian period stuff, so 6th century BC, and then right at the bottom some 19th century material as well. What we have here is material that was excavated by Charles Warren and his team in the 1860s in Jerusalem. Um, what he was doing was looking to find out more about the Temple Mount on the uh, Haram al-Sharif and about the archaeology and the ancient history of Jerusalem specifically. And this is in the 1860s, it's a good 20 years before Petrie comes along with his notions of stratigraphy and ceramic chronologies and methodologies and comparative chronologies and so on. But already Charles Warren is behaving in many ways like a fully fledged archaeologist. He is, he and his team are not looking at things from the point of view of, oh my goodness me, isn't this splendid? Or how much could I sell that for? Or won't that look good on my mantelpiece and I can talk about it with my friends? No, they're looking at things from the point of view of how interesting they could be, how maybe not them, but somebody else may be able to look at it and give some, get some information from something that previously was not known. And so they're picking up fragments with designs on, they're picking up pieces with maybe inscriptions on, little bits of writing, something which they hope is going to tell them something about the society which made the article, the artifact from which that fragment comes. And in addition, in their records, they're very careful to say where they came from, when they found them, how far it was down, sometimes even the soil type. Because after all, they were digging through the stuff, they had to know what they were digging through to make sure they built their shafts correctly. So by default, they were almost doing stratigraphy.